Hey, it's John Justice, a host of My Nerd World and a Star Wars podcast. And before we get this week's show underway, I just want to remind you that if you have not signed up to be on the My Nerd World mailing list, email me, talkshownerd at gmail.com. Uh, by the end of this year, there will be brand new original content available from me, John Justice, and My Nerd World. And if you would like to be the first to know exclusively what this content and project is that I've been talking about on the show now for about two years, because that's about how long it's taken me to get the thing done, then again, drop me an email, talkshownerd at gmail.com, and I will add you to the mailing list, and you will be the first ones on the planet to know what in the heck my secret project actually is. And trust me, if you're a fan of uh, Star Wars, if you're a fan of this podcast, if you like me at all, I'm pretty confident you're going to dig this project once you find out what it is. So again, uh, drop me an email, talkshownerd at gmail.com. Now let's get on with it. Three, two, So what's your name anyway? Hey, kid. There's a big shot gangster. He's putting together a crew. You think everything sounds like a bad idea. If you come with me, you're in this life for good. I waited a long time for a shot like this. My nerd. Thrilled. I got a really good feeling about this. Nothing will stand in our way. I find your lack of faith disturbing. I will finish what you started. Who are you? I know one. There are stories about what happened. It's true. All of it. The Force. It's calling to you. May the Force be with us. My nerd world. Just let it in. Oh, Jabba. Why does she get a blaster and I do? Oh, Java. Hey, it's episode number 134. Glad you are with the show again this week. I am your host, John Justice. Kick things off with a with audio from Solo, a Star Wars story. Because I just want to have some fun this week. I mean, I guess I have fun every single week. But there's not a ton of news to get to. I have a few topics that I want to cover, some things in the Star Wars universe that are of interest of uh, to me right now at this very moment, and we'll get to a little bit of uh, listener feedback this week, but it's the calm before the storm, right? Production on Episode 9 has begun. They are filming maybe right now as I speak. J.J. Abrams has a Twitter account. Why would you do that, J.J.? Twitter is awful. I'm just kidding. I love Twitter, but holy cow, I don't think as a society we were ready to deal with Twitter. But uh, J.J. Abrams tweeted out a picture of some production equipment announcing the start of production. We got into the uh, the cast list uh, last week. I want to talk this week specifically, sort of the core topic for the show is going to be how Episode Nine will end. I have an idea based off of what we know so far. So we'll get into we'll get into that as well. I did start with Solo. I'm looking forward. I'm, I've mentioned it every single week, uh, but um, I'm really looking forward to watching Solo, a Star Wars story again. More so than I thought I was going to, and I think it's partly because I didn't see it as many time uh, as, as many times uh, as I did the other films in the in the theater. And I was listening to another podcast this week talking about it, and uh, a group of people that weren't big fans of the of the film. And I understand why it doesn't have the depth of mythology to it. It's just a fun Star Wars movie, and I'm very curious to see what my reaction is to it once I get the home video release and how often I go back to it. I do tend to think that it's going to be the default Star Wars movie when I don't know what Star Wars movie to watch. Because I, I have this ridiculous thing where I struggle watching the films because I want to get into them, get into them. 
And I feel like if I start The Force Awakens, I want to then watch The Last Jedi right afterwards. So Solo, A Star Wars Story, can easily be one of those films that you just kind of put on and just watch because you don't have to commit yourself, at least for me, to other you know movies in the series uh, in the way that I do when it comes to the other saga films. And so I'm just really looking forward to watching it again. And still got about a month to go before we get the uh, the digital release. So that was the reason why I played the audio at the uh, at the start of the show. A quick note on what I call Colorgate. It's not really an issue. It's only an issue in my mind. But I talked about last week how the first official piece of Episode nine, uh you know, imagery right marketing was released with the ix for nine for the casting out for the casting announcement that was yellow uh now granted the, they did the same thing it was yellow for the last jedi as well so before it ended up becoming red so i thought that was maybe not as relevant as i initially thought it was uh thinking like if they had done the 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 episode eight in red when they did the casting announcement then you know i suppose you could have you know said hey the yellow for nine, you, you know, it, it means they're not going to do blue. Okay, so what am I talking about here? Well, this is what I'm talking about. I was on Amazon, and I was looking at Star Wars books. And the temporary cover art for Claudia Gray's Master and Apprentice novel, I thought, was very interesting. So this is not the final cover. This comes out February of next year. And it just struck me that, okay, so this is a piece of marketing for a product not directly related to Episode Nine, but coming out during the same time period of production of Episode Nine. right? It's blue. I just thought that was really, really interesting because everything that we've seen in terms of marketing hasn't been blue, at least as far as I know. And they usually theme the 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 products coming out around whatever major release is coming out. So if we're going to get a blue logo for episode nine, this cover to Master and Apprentice by Claudia Gray might be the first indication that that is going to that is going to be the case. So I just wanted to point that out. I thought it was interesting. The blue logo looks fantastic. I, mean, I don't know if you remember. I mean, everybody kind of points to Return of the Jedi um, as being the 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 one that had the blue logo. And it's true. I mean, I'm looking. I have the teaser poster of, uh, of Luke holding the lightsaber up. And it is in blue. But I think you got to go back to Empire Strikes Back. I mean, that original marketing for Empire Strikes Back was all blue as well. So, uh, look... When you don't have anything else to kind of chew on right now, we're down to colors <laughs> of what the logo's uh, going to be. I do think it would be really cool that when all is said and done, all three of the logos do have a different color. I think it would be great to see all three of them lined up. And whenever I've seen the, you know, a fan go and do that, um, you know, The Force Awakens in yellow, The Last Jedi in red, and then Episode Nine in blue, I just think it looks really cool. It's a cool little consistency. So maybe that Claudia Gray book is the first indication that that is what we're going to end up uh, we're going to end up getting. All right. So a couple other items of note this week. Not a, not a bunch of stuff. We did have the first set photo from episode nine, like I mentioned from J.J. Abrams, where he uh, where he tweeted out. And I don't think I actually talked about the what the actual content of the of the tweet was. So I'll go ahead and I'll read it because it's relevant to the next story that I want to get into. But J.J. Abrams wrote this, bittersweet starting this chap, this next chapter without Carrie. But thanks to an extraordinary cast and crew, we're ready to go. Grateful for Ryan Johnson. And special thanks to George Lucas for creating this incredible world and beginning a story of which we are lucky to be a part of. Okay. There's a couple of things that I want to dive into on that. Um, however, there's another story. And... As we've talked about, they're going to use footage, and it, when, when it was announced for the casting announcement, that there's going to be footage used of Carrie Fisher from The Force Awakens, right? Okay. Star Wars Newsnet put up a story that actually said that Todd Fisher has revealed that there'll be Last Jedi content as well. Now, I don't know enough about cinematography 
to know whether or not this does create a problem. But I did mention it last week that The Last Jedi is shot very different from The Force Awakens. The Last Jedi has a warmth to it. And I just watched The Force Awakens yesterday and noticed it again. J.J. Abrams' films have, and Dan Mendel has a very specific style of shooting that lends itself to a particular color palette on screen. And J.J. Abrams has the same thing with his cinematographer. Now, I don't know if filters can go ahead and take care of that. But if you put two shots of Carrie Fisher, one from The Force Awakens and one from The Last Jedi, side by side, you can instantly know just based off of the the way the footage was shot, what movie it was from. Okay, Not to mention what I've mentioned before, that Carrie does look a little different in The Last Jedi than she does in The, in, in the Force Awakens. Her face just looks a little different, whether it was um, losing some weight in the face or, or what. She just, she just has a slightly different look from movie to movie. So I trust that, that, Lucas, that Lucasfilm is going to do a great job of, of matching it, so we may, not even, we may not even know. But getting back to this um, StarWarsNewsNet.com story, um, so this was Clayton Sandell from ABC News, um, and it says this. I talked to Todd Fisher today about all of this, and he has been talking with J.J. Abrams about it. I asked him because the press release only said The Force Awakens. So I asked about The Last Jedi, and they are also using unused footage from The Last Jedi. I asked him how many minutes of footage they had from it, and he said, I can't tell you that. Um, He, Todd Fisher, said there were big surprises coming, big surprises in this movie, this performance, and the unused, unused footage, and said that this is this one is really for the fans. But they apparently have a number of unused minutes from both The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi. Todd and the whole family are very excited and wanted it to happen. All right, so there's a couple of things here that I want to talk about. One, I'm always fascinated when somebody who is just a step outside the fandom comments about a Star Wars movie when they have inside knowledge. Todd Fisher, obviously, knows what this story, at a bare minimum, what Carrie Fisher's role in this story is for Episode Nine. He's got the details of Carrie Fisher in Nine. That's how they got permission. They went to him and said, we have this footage. We're planning on using it this way. So he, at a bare minimum, knows what Carrie Fisher's role is going to be in this film. But he's also one step out, right? He's not like me or like you. I, I, I'm, I'm guessing. Okay, this is pure speculation, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm confident in this speculation. He's probably not on Reddit, right? He's probably not watching a bunch of YouTube videos. Okay, Todd Fisher is aware of Star Wars, obviously, seen all the movies, but I imagine he's probably not like an uber fan like we are. So making comments like that, he probably doesn't realize what a big deal that is. To have somebody who knows actual plot details of a movie say there's going to be big surprises in this movie, in the performance and the unused footage, this one is really for the fans, to me, that speaks volumes. Now, I'm going to get into the potential of how Episode Nine can end. Based off of the footage that we know exists, okay, because there's a lot of footage that we don't know that exists. There's a lot of extra footage shot. On Reddit, a lot of people were going down the list of things that have been talked about in the past about footage that was shot, deleted scenes that weren't put on particular releases that we haven't seen. So a lot of this is just based solely off of the knowledge of the scenes that we know for sure exist, like we know for sure there is a, there exists a scene of Princess Leia addressing the council in the in the Hosnian system about having getting some help for the resistance that was cut from the film. That can obviously right play a big significant role in episode nine. We also know that there's a scene because we saw it in the trailer, and this is what I'll get to in a little bit. Of, of Maz Kanata handing the legacy saber over to Leia. We know that scene exists. We also know some other scenes, and I don't know what's surrounding it, but I, me- I remember in the, uh, in the celebration trailer from 2015, there was the shot of, and this is Daisy Ridley, but there's a shot of Daisy Ridley holding that big, what looked like white kyber crystal. Um, and also there's some speculation about whether or not there was a scene between Kylo Ren and Carrie Fisher at some point in time that was shot. I know there was some behind the scenes footage where the two of them were in the same vicinity. And so there was 
some speculation that maybe they they didn't they didn't indeed have a have a scene together. Um, we do know that J.J. Abrams shot a ton of footage with Princess Leia um, because he I guess he shoots a lot of coverage. He shoots a lot of extra stuff, and people say he does that because he wants to throw individuals off of you know in production so that you know stuff doesn't get uh, doesn't get leaked out. As far as what Ryan Johnson shot, I, I don't know. Um, I wonder if there isn't some footage of Luke and Leia from the end of The Last Jedi on Crate that maybe wasn't used. Although, I have a bit of a tough time with that because I feel like Luke and Leia, their exchange was so perfect in The Last Jedi that to have them revisit one another again doesn't seem likely. Okay. So before I double back to how I think this movie could end in a really dramatic way when it comes to Carrie Fisher, I just want to make one more quick point about J.J. Abrams and in specifically the tweet. Okay, People were pointing to this tweet about production starting. Grateful for Ryan Johnson. Um, people were pointing to that tweet as kind of a, hey, Grateful for what Ryan Johnson did, you know, in, in The Last Jedi. Glad to be a big part of this. I think that's a big part of it. People are also pointing to the tweet now, the grateful for right to for Ryan Johnson, meaning that maybe Ryan Johnson is allowing some of his footage. I don't know if allowing is the right word. I'm fairly certain that if Lucasfilm wants to use unused footage from The Last Jedi, that they're, they're going to use it. But maybe they're saying that when it comes to Carrie, because the tweet was about Carrie, bittersweet starting this chapter without Carrie, saying that he was grateful for Ryan, to, for Ryan Johnson was actually more of a nod to grateful that he has the footage that we can go and use for, for Episode Nine. But the point that I wanted to make with this was how this trilogy of The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, and episode nine, I think is going to be incredibly special because it is just Ryan Johnson's and J.J. Abrams trilogy. And I hadn't really put it in those terms until I started reading about that Carrie Fisher story. I really do admire and I I mean, I love J.J. Abrams work as a director. Uh, There is not a J.J. Abrams movie, and I've said this time and time again, that I do not like. I like all of his films. I love his Star Trek movies. Mission Impossible 3 is my favorite of all the Mission Impossibles, and the new one is is fantastic. He makes infinitely watchable films. They're, they're, they're fun movies. They're compelling movies. Now, The Force Awakens doesn't have nearly as much depth as The Last Jedi, but it didn't have to. Sitting down and watching it over the weekend... He succeeded, in my opinion, with what his goal was with Lawrence Kasdan when he said he just wanted to make a movie that would delight. It is a delight. It's a fun movie to watch. I mean, it, it really is from start to finish. There's not a part in that movie, much like The Last Jedi, but in a different way. There's not a part of that movie that I just don't enjoy on a different level from from The Last Jedi. And to me, that's the best way to go and wrap up this series. And the fact that we got this, I, I, I want to say mini epic, but it is an epic, but it's kind of like a mini epic because it's such a personal story, but it, it just does so much. With The Last Jedi in the middle, I really do think that this sequel trilogy has the potential to be the best of all three trilogies. You immediately already have the technology factor that's in play, right? When it comes to special effects, this sequel trilogy is going to be better than the other two, in my opinion. The original trilogy, a product of the times, is fantastic, but limitations. And we're able to look past those limitations because of nostalgia. I'm still shocked at how good those films are, even before the tweaks of the special edition in the original trilogy, when compared to other films of the era. Like, I was watching, um, this was a while back, but I was watching some old Star Trek movies, and I remember putting on um, Search for Spock. Right, because Wrath of Khan's pretty solid when it comes to special effects. Um, and The Voyage Home is, is pretty solid. But I was watching Search for Spock, and um, 
boy, there is some dodgy special effects in that movie. And I was I was shocked because I'm like, man, this was made around the same time as the Star Wars movies, and this is atrocious. Even going back to the prequel trilogy, I was watching um, The Martian with Logan, with my, my 16-year-old, and the footage of Mars is just stunning in that film. And watching it, I just sat back and went, oh, man, if George could only have made like Attack of the Clones uh, now based off of the, the ability we have in terms of technology. Can you imagine uh, Geonosis and Attack of the Clones looking as good as the landscape of Mars does in The Martian? So immediately, again, my opinion, you have the 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 special effects work in the, the sequel trilogy is already going to be better. But when it comes to the story and the fact that you just have two directors doing this, and you have a director like J.J. Abrams who is going to be bookending this trilogy with this amazing masterpiece in the middle that puts our characters through an emotional ringer, has me, I mean, obviously so excited for Nine, but has me excited for what we as fans are going to have for years upon years to come once this trilogy is is done. And if this is the end of the Skywalker saga, as they are saying that it is, which I'm, which I'm fine with, and I know there's some, there's some talk, and I've heard from from uh, from some of you talking about, you know, Ben Solo and how Solo is still a Skywalker, so it could be a, a Solo story down the line, you know, being that with with the Skywalker lineage carried on through a through a Raylo esque redemption of Ben and him not dying at the end of Nine. I get that, and that's uh, that's absolutely. Totally, uh, totally possible. Um, unless for some listeners of the show, there ends up being a Ray and Poe Dameron uh, romance in, instead. Shout out to the individual that I'm speaking to. That is a possibility, just like I said uh, last week. But the fact that J.J. Abrams is the kind of director that J.J. Abrams is, I think personally puts us in a position where this could end up being, as I've said, the best trilogy of all three. And it's all subjective, right? I mean, it really, it, it really, really is. But to have Ryan Johnson come in and basically shake up that Star Wars snow globe the way that he did, because it's really, I mean, it's a really good analogy when you think about it, right? So you got J.J. Abrams, and he kind of makes the snow globe, and he puts all the characters in the snow globe, and he's got them all in their place. But yet there's all this, there's all the, there's all the snow dust, just all the snow, the flakes are just sitting there at the bottom of the globe. And then Ryan Johnson gets it and he spends the movie and he shakes the globe up. And then by the end of the film, those pieces of snow all land back on the bottom. But what happened? They're all in different, they're all in different places now. They're all covering the characters that J.J. Abrams put in that snow globe in a different way than they did before. Now... Um, or Ryan Johnson did. Now J.J. Abrams gets to come and take that snow globe, and he gets to go and wrap the whole thing up. Okay, the snow globe analogy works for the first two moves, and not really for the third. <laughs> okay, I'm super excited, and I know that there's some talk smattering I've seen, and I hope it doesn't continue. That there's a lack of enthusiasm for uh, for Episode Nine. Um, I think that th- if there is, that's only because we're so in the early stages and still sort of post solo and what happened at the box office with that. And people still talking last Jedi. Once we get to the end of the year and the beginning of next year and the marketing actually starts kicking in. And if JJ Abrams does end up kind of going the, the route that um, Ron Howard did of keeping us up to date and up to speed on the production, even if it's just small, simple things that we can talk about. I think you're going to see that hype begin to build for episode nine. And I fully expect that Disney, as I've said, and Lucasfilm are going to take full advantage of the fact that this is, as they said in that press release, the final chapter of the Star Wars saga. Something inside me has always been there. And I was awake. And I need help. So here is here is what I think the problem that J.J. Abrams, well, one of a few problems, right? But the problem that Lucasfilm and J.J. Abrams has with the passing of Carrie Fisher, right? How do you handle Princess Leia in The Last Jedi 
without pushing her off as a side character. You can't ma- you, you you in my opinion you can't mass Kanata it, right? Meaning you can't mass Kanata it in the Last Jedi. So, you know, Ryan Johnson put Mass Kanata on a hologram in the Last Jedi. It was a key point of the movie to get, you know, Finn and Rose to go to Canto Bite, but that was it. I don't personally think you can do that with Princess Leia. I don't think that you are if you're going to have her in the film, she needs to be in the film. And if she's going to be in the film, then she needs a proper emotional send-off at the end. So how do you do that? I think I have an idea. And we'll see. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Just a thought that I had. I was out on my bike ride, and I was thinking about... I was listening to another podcast, and I was thinking about the show this week, and it just landed. This landed in my mind. One shot that we all know exists for for certain because we've seen it, um, at least a part of it, is... Maz Kanata handing the Legacy Saber over to Princess Leia. And she's in, if I remember correctly, in that trailer, she's in the same outfit that she wore at the end of The Force Awakens, that gown. Which, in my opinion, was the best that she looked, apart from the outfit she was wearing on Canto Bite. It's the best that she looked throughout both of those of those films. So how do you wrap up Princess Leia's story in a in a good dramatic way i think it's that scene so let me throw a what if out there so we know the leg the the legacy saber was destroyed but ray's got both parts right so she can easily put it back together again and even if it's cobbled together you can fix that you know with cgi work we wouldn't even know You know, I think the only problem that Disney and Lucasfilm has is that there's a trailer out there that actually has that shot in it. But be that as it may, they're going to have to look that aside. So let's assume they use that scene of Maz Kanata handing uh, a lightsaber. And let's assume just for the sake of my of my perfect ending for Leia that it is the legacy saber. And they do some alterations to it to show that that Ray had put it back together to use it again. So why would Maz Kanata have it, and why would she be giving it to Leia, and how would that make for a meaningful finale to the film? So let's assume that we have resolution when it comes to Ben's redemption. Peace has been brought to the galaxy. I was looking at a tweet online talking about George Lucas and how things rhyme and how he wants the movies to be uplifting and he wanted the end of Return of the Jedi to be uplifting and happy, and I agree with that. You want the end of Episode Nine to be a happy ending. Peace has finally come to the galaxy and everybody is in their places, you know, and riding off into the galactic sunset and one that isn't, you know, what used to be Starkiller Base, right? Okay. So what if that means that... There is a resting of arms, meaning that, you know, Rey becomes the Jedi for the movie in and of itself. But in that, by the end, a balance is finally struck. She doesn't need to be that Jedi anymore. And she lays down her lightsaber as she goes off to wherever it is she needs to go. And this kind of ties back into my ending that if there is redemption or when there is redemption of Ben Solo, if he does live then in my opinion, he would be with Ray, and they would have to go off by themselves. I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but even the thought of returning back to Tatooine, where it all started, instead of going back to Jakku, um, why does everybody want to go back to Jakku? What if it turns out that, like, what if, <laughs> this is really fanboyish of me, but I'm going to go there. What if Ray and Ben actually end up on the Lars homestead? What if that's where they actually decide that they're going to go and put themselves? Because think about this for a moment. We're so far removed from the original, you know, from Luke Skywalker by now that most people probably wouldn't even be aware that that was his former home. So how poetic would it be if Ray and Ben Solo end up going off into hiding, doing that thing with my fingers, on Tatooine at the former Lars homestead. Oh, I'm going to bring myself tears thinking about it. Okay, so back to my ending. This is how you make a powerful ending. So what if what if it's Maz Kanata that Rey gives the saber to when she leaves at the end of the film for the happy ending as she goes off into the sunset with a redeemed Ben Solo? And what if the end of the film and the final shot for Leia is Maz 
handing the legacy saber to Princess Leia, knowing it was her brother's all along, right? I mean, then go and then I mean, ultimately going back to to her father, and that is the final moment that we get for Leia is her receiving that that saber. And she's already dressed for the occasion. She already looks fantastic. I mean, you could, ch- I mean, I'm sure that, you know, through the magic of CGI, you can actually even change the way that that dress looks, color, design, and we wouldn't even know. Now, they could have other footage that that, that, that could lend itself to that. We also have the shot of, at the end of The Force Awakens, with Leia standing there saying goodbye. And, you know, the, the Star Wars movies have n- usually ended with a scene or something like that. However, I just I know that I personally would be incredibly satisfied with that ending if the ending was Maz Kanata handing the legacy saber put back together by Rey, peace has come to the galaxy, she doesn't need it anymore, and Leia gets it back to where it needs to go. I just think that would be absolutely just spectacular. Um, along with that, a lot of talk just real quick, and then we'll move over to, um, to listener feedback this week, but, you know, talk about force ghosts in the film and hopefully to see a return of Anakin Skywalker. Um, there's a, they're going to have to be really careful with it. Cause I think it's going to have to be handled delicately. Like what I'm talking about is having the force ghosts all appear. Um, I know at the end of return of the Jedi, when you've got the three, when you've got, you know, you've got Anakin, you've got Obi Wan, and you've got um, you've got Yoda. Okay, um, having Luke in there, having all four of them, I, I I don't know if that's too much. I think if it's done properly, but I do think that in wrapping up this whole trilogy, um, there's going to have to be a return of of Anakin as a Force ghost. I really do. Um, we already know that he can do it because we saw him do it in Return of the Jedi. Maybe he plays a, a key role within the film in talking with with Kylo before he's he's redeemed. Then I'm just going off that assumption for the sake of the for the sake of the conversation. But if we're really wrapping it up, I mean, things that we as fans kind of need. Uh, not that I wouldn't be, I won't be happy without it. But I just think if you're going to wrap it up, then it makes sense to do that. I just don't know if you have them all at the same place at the same time. One interesting thing to note, and then we'll move over to uh, to listener feedback this week, is part of the, and I'll have to go back and look, and maybe I'll cover it on next week's show, but part of the original concepts that George Lucas had for the original trilogy was the ability of Force Ghost to actually get physically involved in in battles, if I remember correctly. I think that was actually part of the ending of Return of the Jedi. And feel free to do my homework for me and email me, talkshownerd at gmail.com, when you sign up to be a part of the newsletter so you can be the first ones to find out about this secret project that I've been working on all this time. Um, if you want to give me or point me in the right direction to, to find that and do my work for me, that would greatly be appreciated. Um, you can also hit me up, obviously, on, on YouTube or on Twitter as well, at uh, the or at John Justice or the My Nerd World. But I'm, I'm fairly certain that George Lucas had a concept where Force Ghost could interact in a in a fashion with the real world. And I mean we saw that with Yoda in in The Last Jedi, not just in his ability to set the the um the temple, you know, the the Jedi library on fire, um Treebrary on fire, but also I mean he bonks Luke on the nose with a stick for crying out loud. Um, oh, by the way, I heard somebody mention. What did I hear? I just heard it this morning, too. What was I listening to? Anyway, I heard somebody mention that there was a theory going around that J.J. Abrams would bring Luke back to life, like all the way, right? Like he'd resurrect him. And I was like, "What? Are you talking? What are you? What are, what are you talking? I, no, 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 no. He's gone." And then we would see full blown Luke, powerful Jedi. We did in the Last Jedi. When he used his force powers to project himself, and then he died because of it, because the effort killed him, just like Kylo said it would, <laughs> right? Kylo said it would. Um, yeah, this idea that the J.J. Abrams would resurrect Luke. No, 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 no. I think the whole point of putting in the press release that Mark Hamill was going to be in Episode Nine was to put that to that to to rest, right? Just to let everybody know, hey, now you're getting Lando Calrissian and you're getting Luke Skywalker. So those upset at the Last Jedi, you know, but don't worry about it. You're getting more Luke again, and it's going to be Force Ghost Luke. It's not going to be, you know, 
resurrected no Luke, no don't even don't even don't even go there so all right so that's my thought let me know what you think um your thoughts as well always like uh you know i always like hearing from from you guys and whether or not you think i'm uh i'm crazy but i think that would be amazing now again that's just a shot that we know exists the handing of the lightsaber and who better to do that than Maz Kanata, who was the one that had it in the first place in The Force Awakens. See, it rhymes, poetry. Okay. And then the, you know, the lightsaber ends up back with, yeah, you, you got it. You understand. You like it, right? It's good. That's a good ending. JJ, if you haven't got the ending yet, there's your ending right there. I just gave it to you. Princess Leia getting the legacy saber as Rey and, and Ben Solo uh, head off to the Lars homestead to, to live in peace and, and, uh, die happy uh fat and old as uh moisture uh, farmers and making sure they don't catch themselves on fire i need someone to show me my place in all this get it because uncle owen and nap peru they they like burned and it was really sad and stuff have you heard the theory by the way of that that was boba fett that did that and that's why that's why uh that's why Darth Vader told Boba Fett no disintegrations. I love that theory. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, so the theory is, in case you hadn't figured it out by what I just said, I'll kind of lay it out again, that um, when when they went after the droids in A New Hope and uh, Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru uh, got all Kentucky fried. Um, oh, I'm sorry. That's Kentucky Fresh Chicken now, isn't it? So when they got fried, when they got burned, that, that was Boba Fett that actually tracked him down and did all that damage to him. And burned him that way. I remember as a kid. That freaked me out, man. Um, and that's why Darth Vader tells Boba Fett, you know, I want them alive, no disintegrations. Because he went and dis- disintegrated Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru. And Anakin slash Vader would be kind of bothered by that. Because, you know, that's, he was related to him. Yeah. All right, let's get into uh, some some listener <laughs> listener feedback. Just a couple this week. Thank you so much. Again, you can uh, email talkshownerd at gmail.com or drop a uh, a comment on YouTube. First one comes from front of the show, Jennifer Oliver, says, Hey, John, if Nine's casting decisions are any indication of the good choices we will continue to see in getting Nine ready, then steady on JJ. I'm enjoying this never-to-be-repeated time as well, referencing last week that this is the last time time that we will be in this period of time before the end of the last chapter of the Skywalker saga and this nine story arc. I was just in uh, I, I was just an annoying little sister they didn't know what to do with. So they brought me along to the Star Wars movies as a kid and I ended up being a bigger fan. This saga has spanned my life, so it's definitely something I want to enjoy every little bit of, one thing at a time. I'm enjoying sharing it with you and your listeners. Thank you, Jennifer. I always enjoy your comments. I very much appreciate it. And, you know, I mean, look, I saw, you know, A New Hope in the Theater when I was five years old, for crying out loud. <clears throat> and it's funny because it makes that, thinking back to that really makes the time between now and episode nine next December not seem very long. Like, can you imagine a five-year-old? <laughs> I didn't even think about it. Can you imagine being five years old <laughs> and being told, hey, uh, there's going to be nine films, but you're not going to be able to see the end and number nine until you're 46 years old. <laughs> what? Uh, can I just get an R2-D2 action figure, please? Huh? How ridiculous would that be, right? <sighs> All right, let's go here. Zach uh, Hamilton writes this. Thank you for the Star Wars-related positivity. I needed it today. Red Letter Media uploaded a video today in which they added in some snide remarks about Disney and Star Wars, which would normally annoy me, but I really enjoy their sense of humor. I disagree with them a lot about Star Wars, but they do make th- they do make me think about things more deeply. John, I am just curious. Do you know about them? Yes, I do. And their Star Wars content? Yes, I do. Uh, You might find them to be a bit too cynical. Yes, I do. But I would recommend their channel to anyone who likes analysis and review of the Star Wars franchise. I defend the prequels a lot. However, I still love their biting critiques of those films. Yeah, I don't do Red Letter Media. um, And I avoid that negative stuff. All this stuff is so subjective, right? And I just prefer when it comes to my Star Wars critiques, to hear stuff that's 
that's positive. You know, there used to be a way this stuff was parodied. You know, when you look at Robot Chicken and things like that, there used to be a way when it was done with, there was a certain, there was still a certain sort of reverence to it and respect to the source material, even though we were pointing out, you know, some of the problems. So much of it has gotten just so tinged with negativity, and people do that just to get, you know, it's like it's like the the some of the biggest providers of Star Wars analysis on YouTube. Not all of them, mind you, but some of them. Some of the biggest providers of Star Wars analysis on YouTube are ones that are either one lying. I'm particularly talking about individuals that have you know zero attached to their name, um, or they're individuals that are just pushing negative stuff, and I just don't. I don't, I just, I don't have time for it. So, you know, if people dig it. That's cool. You know, whatever. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm aware of it, uh, but I don't watch their stuff because I like positive stuff. Um, Alex Shepers writes this. What are your thoughts, uh, what thoughts on Ivan Ortega's YouTube channel, his thoughts and changes to The Last Jedi? Yeah, and again, it kind of falls into the same category as before. I have no interest in seeing anybody else's artistic interpretation of The Last Jedi. Um, the facts that he puts in, look, to each their own, people dig it, that's cool. But the fact that Ivan Ortega puts on his, um, his, his clips, you know, fixed, I fixed this, I fixed that. Who are you to say you fixed it? Why don't you just write, I like this better. I made this better in my, you didn't fix anything. I think The Last Jedi is perfectly fine the way that it is. So yeah, I, I just, I, I don't bother. I do like, um, I forgot who it was, but um, I do like the one guy that did um, like special editions of the film and he, he kind of beefed up like fight scenes and battle sequences and stuff. I can't remember. I'm sure somebody will email me or message me um, and, and let me know what it is I'm talking about. But that I thought was cool where they went and they put in, they just enhanced some of the effects even more so than they did with the special editions. I, I dig that. Because that's more just about a different, uh, more about sort of special edition changes than it is like actual change in content or story or or, or dialogue or the uh, you know directorial choices about certain scenes, right? Uh, one more, and Anna's referencing um, the uh, one twenty nine rumors and Skywalker's, where I think was one of the first episodes where I laid out my ideas for the ending of uh, of episode nine. Uh, and Anna says, uh, I love your ending. That would be such an emotional uh, emotional and beautiful way to end this trilogy. Here's hoping I get goosebumps too. And I think that was the idea of everybody going off to their respective places and Ben Solo and Ray, um, perhaps in the Falcon, right? Um, the son getting back his, his father's car kind of kind of deal and uh, maybe dropping Chewie off on uh, on Kashyyyk to be back with his, with his family. Um, I really do like my... my I'm going to be tickled if that ends up being true. If that's what they end up doing for the end of Episode Nine. Uh, that's going to be pretty interesting. All right. Uh, thanks again. Spreaker, Stitcher, iTunes, uh, YouTube, Podbean is where you can check it out. Um, again, email me, talkshownerd at gmail.com, as I said at the start of the show. This um, all original content project should be done uh, before the end of the year. But if you want to be the first to find out what it is, then drop me an email and tell me to add you to the mailing list. Talkshownerd at uh, gmail.com. Really excited. And again, I mean, if you like Star Wars, you like this podcast, you think that I'm an okay person, I really think you're gonna dig you're gonna you're gonna dig um you're gonna dig this project. I really, really do. I'm I'm super excited about it. And uh like I said, I've been working on it for about two years and I'm I'm uh, in the uh, in the final stages of uh, getting it just just right. Uh, and I can't wait to unleash it and, um, you know, see what the uh, see what the response is. So thank you so much for checking out the show, as uh, always, and uh, hope to uh, hear from you in the uh, in the coming week. Have yourself a fantastic week, and we'll talk to you real soon. Bye. The Force will be with you always. My Nerd World.